Welcome back to Seek Stand and welcome back to Seek a Strength. Today's video, I want to talk a little bit about the method of cutting water weight. So this is a method we have used with our athletes and we used ourselves to cut approximately 5% of an athlete's water weight within the week of the weight cut. So a lot of you guys watching are obviously weight class athletes. Your athletes who need to make the weight class for a certain number of endeavors might be fighters, strength class athletes. Uh, who else needs to make weight? Other people? photo shoot you might need to make a photo shoot so this is something we've used quite a bit in relation to uh, our athletes quite successfully however i do want to point out before we get going with the video or before we get into nitty gritty this is a secondary option for making weight for your weight class everyone else doing this and we really recommend this and it's a recommendation even when we're doing it ourselves when we've had to use it and when our athletes have had to use it this is not the best option to do this because there's going to be inevitably some amount of performance decrease now this depends on the individual how resilient you are how well you enact the protocol how well you rehydrate and what kind of uh, performance you're looking for ultimately though everyone will have just a little bit of performance decrease all the way up to intolerable some athletes will find this absolutely horrendous and will not be able to do this so when it comes to making weight for a meat or when it make when it comes to kind of cutting weight this is a secondary option where you've kind of messed something up earlier we always prefer and our first option for making weight for a meat is always cutting slowly and appropriately down to the meat now there is a whole host of people out there who can help you do this a lot of people are very good with this individual athletes but there's also a lot of professionals whose entire career is built around helping athletes make weight while still keeping performance high and that is our first protocol so if you're not sure of how to do that yourself then we recommend getting someone to help you do that so we don't like people to rely on this. Uh, using this too many times throughout the year can be hit or miss sometimes. And if you use it too much, sometimes it can go a little bit awry. So not only can you have that decreased performance, you can also have sporadic poor performances, even in people who tolerate this water cut very well. So typically what we see is about 5% water cut, and that's what we like to aim for. Anything more beyond that is a little bit unreliable. It's certainly more drastic and requires you to cut more water during the time when there's a lot of uh, hydroretic hormone being produced. So we like that 5%, and some of the studies do show that. Uh, other people will go closer to 10% of their body weight, but that does involve a lot of thermic effect and trying to sweat out more water weight, which we're not a huge fan of, especially if you have something like two hour wanes. Right, so what's actually happening during a water cut? You would have heard Gurf just talk about increasing natural diuretic hormone. Uh, you'll commonly hear people talk about flushing out water. What's really happening here is actually unknown in the scientific uh, world or the literature is certainly conflicting on what's happening. So certainly when you drink more water, you get an increase in natural diuretic hormone, right? Uh, vasopressin is probably the most common one you'd hear being talked about. You'd hear about the suppression of this, right? So vasopressin is a, a hormone that's secreted within the body to hold on to water. Uh, it's obviously very important. In a normal human, you'd want just standard levels of this. When you start taking on more water, you'd suppress this hormone. If you were in a, a some way depleted environment where you couldn't get enough water or, or drinking or your hydration might be uh, compromised you will get upregulation of vasopressin so when we're loading water in a system like this we expect to have an increase in vasopressin or sorry a suppression of vasopressin and this would help us secrete more water shed more water draw water out of muscle cells and out of the liver and then piss it out via our kidneys what a lot of modern literature is is kind of speculating on more more poignantly than that is that we're actually getting the upregulation or the opening of these these ports called aquaporin and aquaporin two ports. These are basically like floodgates of the kidneys. They're they're in other cells as well. But what you basically have is you have a small uh, gateway. When you have increased water intake, this gateway will swell or it will open out in order to pass more water through it. And now what's happening when you're loading water is that these gateways are swollen or open for, for a prolonged period of time. Then when you stop your water intake, those gateways have a bit of a delayed reaction and you shed more water in that way. No matter what's going on with the mechanism though, we understand that when we do get this kind of stepwise increase or a, a periodical loading of water, followed by a, a drought where we're not taking on any water, 
athletes do lose more water and their their initial return to homeostasis is kind of super compensatory so it's it drops down below the standard level and then they'll come back up again it's in this small trough is where we want to be weighing in so in terms of the the practical logistics of water loading then it's quite simple so what you do is you start off and you first understand the baseline of water you drink every day most of us will drink two or three liters of water a day if you're an endurance athlete and you're drinking up to five or six liters of water a day obviously it's going to be very very different for you right but in a standard case if you're a hundred kilo male and you drink three liters of water a day and you're weighing in on a saturday morning for a saturday afternoon weightlifting competition This will give you a rough idea for where you want to be. So imagine you start on Sunday, you probably have a a kind of heavy single session on a Sunday, depending on your tapering week. If you start on Sunday, you're probably going to start off somewhere around three liters of water, your standard intake as per normal. On Monday, then that might go to three and a half liters of water or four liters of water. By Tuesday, you're going to get up around five liters of water. Wednesday and Thursday, you'll maintain around six liters of water so kind of around five to seven percent of body weight is is a rough idea for for your kind of loading of water intake once you stay at seven or six or seven liters of water for wednesday and thursday you then don't drink anything on friday so you have that suppression of vasopressin you have that opening of those aquaporin gates then on friday when you're not drinking any water and when i talk about not drinking any water literally like 250 milliliters of water in a little cup next to you if you're absolutely parched that's really all we want you to be drinking for the entire 24 hours prior to weighing in if you're really struggling just some ice chips inside in a cup can help but you really want to limit this as much as possible like unless you're getting faint you really don't want to be taking on too much water you're not going to be training the day before anyway so we then have 24 hours pre-comp with no water intake we will hopefully have pissed out all this water so in a very kind of passive environment you might use uh you just going to the toilet as normal would be a very passive way of shedding water also saunas would be a very passive way hot baths would be a very passive way all these things will help to to shed that water out then if you were to be a bit more active you might be looking at kind of exercising in a sauna or going for a run in the, those plastic suits something along those lines to be a bit more active with it but essentially what you're doing is you're just helping that water to be shed out and then we'll talk later on about your refeeding afterwards so when we kind of talk about this method we use it with our athletes and people ask us about it one of the biggest questions people ask is what kind of sodium intake and what kind of dietary restrictions should i follow the week of the competition and the reason we like this and the reason we recommend this when we're using with athletes is because for our particular method and our way of doing this and we're looking for that 5% kind of 5% or less change in body weight is that we recommend you don't change your diet. Now, but I know you might be listening to this, you might talk about someone, this is their method and this is their method and this works really well for them and I'm sure it works and I'm sure it works really well. We're just talking about our methods, which is to keep it as simple as possible. It's the most effective and consistent method we've seen of all of these that we've tried. So when it comes to dietary restrictions or dietary changes during the week of the competition, we recommend that you don't change your diet. Don't change your sodium intake. Don't increase or decrease your sodium intake. Don't change your dietary calories. Don't change your macros. Don't change anything like that. What we've seen, if you're in a caloric deficit, continue with your caloric deficit. If you've done this before and you know it works quite well, continue with the maintenance calories that you're using and don't change anything else don't decrease sodium don't add in more sodium don't do anything like this don't add potassium salt or anything like that we recommend keeping this nice and simple this reason is because we know this works for this percentage of body weight when we use it with our athletes and we know that if you change these things if you change your sodium intake you might change your performance if you're not used to doing it if you change your calories you could certainly impact your performance negatively so we like this because it doesn't add a lot of variables this minimizes the amount of variables we're doing with this now we know you could lose more weight certainly and you could do other methods that would let you lose more weight but we don't recommend that we're not particular fans of it ourselves now we've worked with athletes of course who've done large weight cuts and that has worked out well but they're athletes looking for you know very high levels of performance near very big kind of international competitions you know with fighters or powerlifters and in those scenarios they've either done it a lot themselves or we've had someone help them with that or they've had their own individual who helps them do that kind of thing now it's worked in those scenarios you know if you have a 24-hour weigh-in you can do those crazy big water cuts you can do that sauna you can do the 
uh, thermal suits and things like that. But for this one, this is a nice, simple, you know, usually for most people, this is kind of two, two and a half kilos in most scenarios. So it's a nice productive method. You don't have to worry about your dietary changes. You don't have to worry about how much sodium you're taking. You know, some people might say, does sodium help you retain water? Depends in some individuals. What seems to happen is when they increase their sodium intake, the water retention they experience is temporary for a few days and then this levels out again quite normally. That's why you might see a temporary change in blood pressure. And then after a few days of those increased sodium levels, you'll see a reduction and return to normal or homeostasis for the vast majority of people in their blood pressure. But then we might have a very small percentage of people who are sodium sensitive in relation to their blood pressure. And then you'll know if you're one of those individuals and something you need to test. Outside of that, you don't want to be changing these things during your competition week and certainly not putting yourself in a scenario where for your local provincial competition or your kind of, you know, smaller time level BGJ meet or, or your MMA fight or something like that, you don't want to be absolutely murdering yourself unless you have to for these scenarios. A lot of big, large weight cuts, you know, 10% plus kind of things can take their toll on the body and we don't really want to be pushing those things too frequently. We prefer to get more control of your weight, do it through dietary means over a longer period in a much safer manner. So in short, dietary changes, don't change your diet, don't do anything different, just let the water manipulation do its job in this scenario. Okay, so after you've pissed out all that water weight and you've weighed in and you're feeling very good, what's the next thing you do? So people talk about refeeding, they talk about rehydrating. There's a couple of specific things you wanna keep in mind here. So the first thing is, immediately after weighing in, you wanna take in a quite large bolus of, of liquid and carbohydrates, electrolytes and salt. So what we usually say is around 600 milliliters to 900 milliliters, this will be kind of followed up by, or backed up by a number of very reputable coaches in the area. That amount of liquid at body temperature, so 35 to 40 degrees Celsius, it's going to taste horrible and it's not going to be enjoyable to drink. But you definitely don't want cold liquids going straight into your stomach. It needs to be that kind of body temperature. In that liquid then, you firstly need to make sure it's an isotonic solution. So making sure it, the concentration levels aren't too high. If you were to just drink something like a Lucasade Sport or a Powerade immediately, that solution might actually be slightly too concentrated for you. So in our water mixture, we'd like to have some carbohydrates. We'd like to have some sodium. Some MSG can actually be very, very useful, although uh, in many cases a bit clunky for kind of getting it there. But certainly if you were to have some MSG in some of your uh, more solid food later on, it'd be very good for you retaining some water. And then we want to keep that water coming for the next few hours. So. If we've taken on six to 900 milliliters of water in our isotonic solution, we're drinking our carbs as much as we possibly can. For the next number of hours before you weigh in, you want around a liter an hour. So this is very different, obviously, in a two hour weigh in case where it, it, we'll have to compress things slightly. You'll have to increase that initial bolus and you'll have to increase the, the speed you're taking on water at. But if you weigh in at 10 a.m., and you're lifting at 3 p.m., you're certainly going to be able to take on your initial bolus, then you will sip water at a rate of one liter per hour with carbohydrates and salt in that water, and that should be absolutely plenty to rehydrate you back in. In the case where you're after losing three kilos to your water cut, you really want to be replacing around 1.5 times that, that liquid with the liquids you're taking in, right? So. If I've lost three liters, I'm gonna take in 4.5 liters. If I've lost five kilos, I'm gonna take in seven and a half liters. And something around that kind of ratio is about where you want to be landing. Obviously with your food intake, you need to be careful here. We, we always follow the usual kind of rhetoric of you don't change anything. So if you don't eat that kind of protein bar, you don't eat that kind of protein bar on the day of the competition. If you don't usually eat pancakes for breakfast, you don't usually eat pancakes for breakfast on the day of the competition. So you keep your dietary intakes quite simple. For us, we'll always, always, always prioritize carbohydrate intake because that's going to be the most important thing. The day of the competition, protein intake really doesn't matter. You're not trying to recover for something the next day. So it's always going to be prioritizing carbohydrates, making sure that that kind of glycogen is re replenished back within the muscle again. And yeah, it's pretty simple. Besides that, you stick to the basics. You don't make any major changes. 
And the last thing I'd say is that if you're going to use this method, and this is probably the most important thing in the entire video, you need to have done multiple practice runs. If you're a weightlifter and you're going to use this for nationals, you'd at least want three practice runs where you might have cut leading up to a small scale regional competition, or you might cut leading up to one of your heavy single training sessions. You really need to practice this method. Some people are phenomenally good at it. I've had athletes who will easily shed seven eight ten percent of their body weight repeatedly every time they do it with almost no heartache and no upset i've had other athletes who find not drinking too much water for the day before to be too hard and they they really struggle and they'll struggle to lose two percent of their body weight you know and that's something you need to practice and you don't want it to be figuring that out as you're kind of trying to jog around the car park of the meat and lose the extra few kilos so I hope this helps. If you have questions on water cutting or questions on other aspects of sports performance, pop them down in the comments below. As always, if you have other stories or funny stories of weight cuts, pop them down in the comments below and we'll talk to you all again soon. <coughs> zen. I am a Zen Buddhist monk. So obviously a lot of you guys watching are in water, cla water class sports. Oh my God, they're not mermaids. <laughs> Mermaid, I barely know her. <coughs>